He comes from the Ohio State Newark and Central Ohio Technical College campus. And uh, he works at the John L. and Christine Warner Library as a reference and special collections librarian. Um, he also has worked with the Ohio Native Heritage Archive, which you'll find online. And in concert with, uh, is that the Newark Earthworks? Newark, yeah. Newark Earthworks Center, and where they promote Indian heritage here in Ohio and also the mound builders, and they also collect historical documents as well. John, that's the way it goes. <laughs> Appreciate you letting me come tonight. Uh, the Ohio Native Heritage, uh, Heritage Archives it is the collection that's in the library. The newer Earthworks is a different area of campus. And like everything else, especially in Licking County, we have little pockets of all kinds of folks. We haven't figured out how to all fit together in one body yet. So tonight to give my, my view, which isn't necessarily the same as everybody else's, which would make sense to you, I guess. A uh, couple of things to, uh, to kind of start with, and I'm, I'm Piggybacking this off of, this is uh, the Indigenous Peoples Day holiday week. Monday was the holiday. And I gave a talk at uh, a place in Newark because of the, the holiday in there. So I wanted to kind of start as a springboard of what's going on in that because there's a lot of different discussion in terms of, uh, you know, should we uh, have a, a, you know, a Native American day like that? Uh, should we replace Columbus Day? You know, all kinds of different ways of looking at it. So I'm going to not give you my opinion until we're done, so that you kind of see what I'm building mine on. So uh, that's kind of where we're going to go. And what we're looking at <clears throat> primarily, Mound Builders is a name that we use, kind of a generic type of a name. Uh, it's not, I guess it's a non official name. It's uh, because it, these are the peoples that built mounds. What we're looking at is basically you know, four time periods. Now, not all apply to Ohio, but we got what we call poverty, uh, the Poverty Point area down in Louisiana, which originally they thought was about 1800 uh, BCE, which is you know, almost 4,000 years ago. And recently they have decided it actually goes back to maybe as far back as 3700 BCE, so way back there. And they were the first mound builder group as we know the mound builders you know linked to us today and then after and each one of these are like a culture that's developed and then gone away if you think of uh, in the middle east get the babylonians and then they disappear and the assyrians and they disappear you know they don't really disappear they just kind of meld back into the other peoples over there and some other group stands up and that's pretty much what's happening with uh, the native americans here so poverty point is louisiana the athena culture is the next group that comes along. And that's named because of the farm in uh, Adena, uh, the, the Adena farm in Chillicothe. As we name things uh, a lot of times where we find them, and it's why that gets that name, because it's obviously not a, a native type of a name. And the Adena culture is in the neighborhood of uh, about a thousand years ago, a thousand years BCE. Uh, and they, again, are considered mound builders. They build mounds. They're style of uh, construction was more of a, a cylindrical, uh, like a round mound, and a lot more burial. And that con and their uh, area of operations, what we call a, a riverine society, they're more in the, the river uh, lowland areas. Okay, so that's kind of where they spread out. And again, Ohio is one of those areas that's pretty much the center of this. And then following, or depending on who you read, following the Adena culture is the Hopewell culture, and that's because it's the first mounds that were found and identified with them were found on a, the Hopewell farm, again, down in Chillicothe. Now, some say that Hopewell is kind of embedded within the Adena. Um, I haven't seen that very often, but I, I, that has been a, a theory that's been presented. And the Hopewell came on board in the neighborhood of about, uh, oh, around two, 300, BCE and lasted until about 500 AD. So they ran about 1700, 700 years. And they are, their mound area is centered, you could pretty much say that their, their center of operation is Newark, Ohio, which is wonderful because it's Ohio and that makes us feel good, and Chillicothe. And most of us have probably heard or 
if you visit a bounce, there's a reasonable chance to tell the coffees where you've been. And uh, their type of uh, structure is much more ceremonial instead of burial. So what you're going to be looking at tonight, Hopewell is the area that's, you know, it's the dominant group that's in, in Newark. And that's what you're going to be seeing tonight. And, and when you look at the amounts as I show them to you, I think it's going to become pretty obvious. Wow, those are pretty obvious. It's not like just a pile of dirt. Okay. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Now, before we start into this, I am a librarian, and I've got a master's degree in geography from Ohio U, and it's in cultural geography. And we used to do field trips from OU down to Athens all over the place to go look at cultural places. And in the process of doing that, we drove past Newark, I don't know how many times. Never did we ever stop at Newark to see the mounds. As far as I can remember, I don't recall ever even hearing about the mounds. And you think, wow, you know, how in the world can something like this happen? You know, this, this whole mound issue, you know, I realize we're up in you know, Worcester here, which is a little bit outside of the, the hotbed of activity right now in mounds. Uh, but Lincoln County, with our, our collection of mounds that are there, has applied for uh, UNESCO World Heritage status. Okay? Poverty Point. Now, Louisiana is the next area to, to get it, which makes sense, doing this more in a time order. And then shortly after that, Newark and Chillicothe are supposed to come on board. And it's because of the Hopewell Mounds that are there, okay? And then the question becomes, wow, why has anybody heard about that? Why, why is this so in the dark? Well, it's actually, amazingly, pretty recent that most of this has come to light that we even know very much about what's taking place. I started in Newark in 1998, and they mentioned the mounds were there, and I walked past them a number of times, and they're a mound, so I can't look down in them. They're <laughs> like this right next to the road. So I'd walk by them, and i think, okay, so that's the mounds. It meant nothing to me for about 10 years, and then we started to, to grasp what's going on. So with that kind of a context, and then the other piece of this, as a geographer, there's a couple of key ways that we look at the landscape that's around us. And one of those is we look at location, where things are located. So, you know, that's an important aspect. It gives, a, if you want to think like an address of where things are at. So look on a map, it gives you a way to find it in a map, those kind of things. The other concept, which is what, to me, really applies with the mountains, is what we call place, and that is more of a mental connection, an emotional connection. Um, we're, you know, a variety of different ages in here. If I say, what do you, if I throw out your, your grandparents' home, most likely, most of you are going to have thoughts that come to mind of your grandparents' home and get some kind of relationship. If I'm from Galleon, Ohio, originally. So if I'd say, uh, when I drive down Hosford Road and I go past my grandparents' house, a lot of ideas, a lot of thoughts, a lot of memories come back. And I place, that place becomes very emotionally connected to me. You're going to drive by the house, it's just a house, okay? And that's what I think has happened with the mounds. The mounds have been there, we haven't developed any kind of a, a relationship to those. And that is what has been taking place here of late. So before we get too far to this, I, I want to read just a little clip. This is a, one of the books that's come out fairly recently. It's uh, based on a conference we had down in Newark. And it's called the Newark Earthworks, and it's Enduring Monuments Con uh, Contested Meanings. So it's a, a number of papers that have been presented, different ways of looking at the mount. It's a great book if you want a nice overview of the mount, <laughs> if you want to get one for the library. So um, it's, a, it's a good book. In here, there is the introduction is written by uh, Glenna Wallace, who is the chief of the Eastern Shawnee located in Oklahoma. The Shawnee are the ones who was the dominant tribe that lived in Ohio before all Native Americans were removed. And she heard that this uh, uh, scholar from England was going to be at a conference in Columbus, and she's from Oklahoma. So she rounded up a couple of her, her uh, 
um, colleagues, and they came up to Claudia's because she really wanted to hear this, this speaker and had a lot of questions. She's done a lot of research. She's chief of the Shawnee. So she's done a lot of research in the Shawnee, the history, and all these kinds of things. And they went to the, the, the conference over in Columbus, and then uh, they were invited to come over to Newark to look at the mountains. So she still wanted to carry on the, conference, the, the, the conversation with uh, the scholar. So she came over to Newark. And I'm going to read just a paragraph. Of the whole introduction is pretty moving, but the paragraph will give you a feeling of what I'm trying to get at when I talk about place place. And she says, try to imagine the shock and total disbelief I experienced when I stepped out of the car and looked at this intricate array of earthen walls and landscapes where my people, my ancestors, had lived more than 300 years ago. It was surreal. I had spent at least 30 years researching cultures and histories of civilizations throughout the world. I had read everything I could about my Shawnee tribe, all the places I lived, wars I fought, how they dressed, how they worked, how they ate, what they built, how they believed, what they valued, and how they worshipped. I knew about Serpent Map, but I had never heard of the Newark Earthworks. I had never even heard of Newark, Ohio. I was stunned at what I saw. I was in a state of disbelief. This made such an impact. So the question is, why don't we know very much about this? It's because the connection, I mean, even the Native Americans who that's our ancestry that was there. Didn't know anything about this. And I'm going to start with looking at a couple of posts with the, the posters over. This is the one that you were at. Okay. This is a picture of the Great Circle. The mounds were built by the Hopewell. These were built roughly about 2,000 years ago. This is what we call the Great Circle Mound. And on one picture like this, it's a little hard to tell what's going on. It's roughly about two-thirds of a mile if you walk the circumference all the way around. It's uh, somewhere, I forget, just off the top, I have 2,000 feet across in diameter. They used to hold the county fair inside this. So it gives you a feeling of what this is. It is a circle, has one entry, and we'll come back to this little piece a little bit later. The other part section of this. Oops. That's why you don't have so many spots to put up here. Is what we call, I don't know if you can see that from around the corner there, is what we call the octagon. Now, this is the octagon with a circle that goes to it. This circle is separate from this one over here. These, this was also built roughly about 2,000 years ago. And they've the, the idea was when you first saw the mounds, there was a lot of mounds. We get a couple maps over there and you can kind of see from the, the dots on the map. There's hundreds of mounds. In fact, the question has been, you know, how many mounds are there? The estimate at one time was 100,000 mounds built by all the different mound builders. That number I've seen raised up, they say it could be up to a million mounds. So, but what's a, what's a mound? It's a hill. It's a little pile of dirt most of the time. So if there's not a connecting story to it, so you see a pile of dirt, what's that mean to you? It doesn't mean anything. It's when they figured out what the connection was, to put this together, all of a sudden it gave a reality to it, brought that concept to place. In the first part, early 1980s, 1980s, this is, you know, half of us in this room were alive at that point, so it's not that long ago. Um, Two, two researchers, two faculty members from uh, Earlham College over in Richmond, Indiana, uh, Hively and uh, Horn, came over to Newark to look at the octagon and the Great Circle because a new theory, a new idea on Stonehenge had come out. And Stonehenge was being uh, started to be claimed as a Neolithic site. And they thought, wow, uh, these are close enough. Maybe we could use this to kind of bounce off a couple ideas about Stonehenge. In other words, they're thinking about making this a working tool. And the idea is, I've always heard it, anybody can make bounds line up with solar features out here. Okay, so that's what they figured they're going to do. But I came over, they did their measurements, did all kinds of study. And on the way back to Richmond, they are sitting there saying, that it doesn't connect. The, the, the solar connection doesn't make any sense. And somebody said, well, maybe it's lunar. 
maybe it spilled off to the moon. And they made, a, you know, they sat down and looked at their, their data that they collected and everything. And what they found is that it is a lunar, if you want to think almost like a calendar that's been developed 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, geometry was still being developed by the Greeks. There wasn't a whole lot of understanding of it. Mathematics was pretty basic. We didn't have calculators. We didn't have a lot of stuff, you know, okay? The Native Americans, we don't know how they've done this, the Native Americans watched the cycle of the moon go through its different phases and different cycles. The moon comes up and goes down every night, basically, you know, it's full moon, new moon, full moon, new moon. In the process of doing that, every time it arises, it comes up at a little bit different place on the horizon and goes down in a little bit different place. It goes about nine and a half years in one direction and it goes back pretty much in the other one. It goes through these cycles. Every 18.6 years, it goes through a moon cycle. So that means any particular person that was alive at that time, maybe in their lifetime would have witnessed three full cycles. Now, because lifespan isn't like 80 years old back then, it's probably close to 50. So one of those is probably when they're a little kid. So somehow they documented and identified exactly on the horizon where the most northern point was of this rise, the most southern point of this rise, the most northern point of the setting, and the most southern point of the setting, along with a number of other features in the moon. They documented that, and they built the octagon so that each one of these walls looks like if you lay the yardstick and use it for a sighting line, each one of these walls lines up with, you know, one wall lines up with the most northern point, one wall slides up with the most southern point. So each one of these is indicating some point on that moon cycle. If, oh, well, you look at this, uh, the, the entire complex here is about 50 acres that it's covered. There is a golf course. I should tell everybody that in case you start wondering what all these little white things are. They're sand traps. <laughs> so <clears throat> the octagon has been preserved by the uh, Mount, uh, uh, Mount Builder Country Club in Newark. And because they had lease on the, you know, the, the grounds for you know, 70 years or something like that. We haven't had all the development that you can see all around it. Otherwise, these have been all covered up with houses. So they, they've preserved this. So this whole area has been preserved and they've been able to measure. It's one of the most, we'll say, best manicured is one of them said, best manicured, most preserved mound collections there is anywhere. And they've been able to uh, hold, hold this together so you can actually see what it looks like you know, today. This circle and this octagon are two of three parts of this whole entire complex. When we look at this and we look at this, there's a third part that has pretty much been um, it's called the right, sometimes called the right square, uh, right, like W-R-I-G-H-T, uh, again, named after somebody probably. And that was a complex of mounds, and as I understand it, included burial mounds in that part. These are strictly ceremonial, they're not burial, okay? So the three parts, like three prongs to this one uh, large complex of mounds, and this is the largest mound complex in the world. In addition, when you're looking at the tops of these walls, Basically, they're, they're perfectly level. Now, the landscapes rise and fall. Sometimes the walls are a little higher, sometimes a little lower ground-wise. But each one of these walls is, you know, is, uh, uh, and same with the <coughs> circle, is on the top would be horizontal so that you can see what's going on in the landscape. The sighting of this is so that they can track what's taking place with the moon. And this would have been another part of that other third section. Huge complex. This is all Native American. Pre, probably pretty much pre any metallic 
construction material. You know, this had been, maybe Iron Age would have been here, but uh, you know, probably what they've dug the dirt to make these mountains, it's all been dug, is probably things like deer bone and you know, Flint, those kind of things. Has anybody been to Flint Ridge? Can you hear by chance? Oh. Okay. Flint Ridge is a source of fine flint that's been tracked all over the eastern part of the United States. So it's, it's been traded pretty, pretty widely. And the materials that have been brought in, you know, some of the materials that have been found here, obsidian and some of the other things, are products that have been brought in. So there's 2,000 years ago, there was a pretty extensive trading network that took place all over the you know, eastern part of the United States. So all of this is hand developed, hand built. They load dirt up in a basket and haul it over and dump it. They go back, load up another basket, haul it over and dump it. The guess is seven million cubic feet of dirt were hand dug dumped and used to build the mounds. It's a lot of hand work. Uh, no mechanical types of things. As we understand it, mathematics have been pretty basic. But what they were also able to do is not only identify what's taking place in terms of the relationship of these to the mounds, the, the moon to the mounds, but also the area that's within you know, the, the, the um, octagon and the area within the circle is just about the same amount of area, very close. Which means they have somehow figured out how to what they call square in the circle. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, so I, I'm not even remotely going to try to explain it to you what's going on. But to figure out what the area of the circle is and make that equal to the area of the octagon is pretty advanced mathematics. When the first Europeans saw this in the early 1800s, there was a pile of you know, a whole bunch of mounds, and some of them had a bit of a, a relation, you know, a, a, an interesting design to them. But to ever give credit to the Native Americans that were here to be able to do that kind of complex mathematics, uh, till, and still today is you know, questioned by a lot of folks. So at one point in the history of Native Americans, they had a pretty extensive knowledge and capability of, of mastering um, that kind of mathematical relationship that's taking place. Now, in addition to this, I'm going to go through a couple other posters here because I want you to get those before I forget to see them all up here. Notorious for doing. This gives you a little bit more of an idea of, of some of the mound, the walls that are there. You will notice, like right here, is probably the most obvious one. There's passages. Those passageways, the mounds are equal, lines are parallel, and they're all basically the same elevation. They have a number of these passageways. If you wanted to enter the mounds area, you came in by a point of the passageway because they had little mounds on the inside that served as like, you know, so you couldn't come in any other way. You had to, had to follow these passageways. The passageways, one led from the octagon over to the great circle. There was another one of roughly the same length that led from the octagon to the right square. And the right square led one over the great circle. So these were tied together. It's not just the mountains, just the octagon, just the great circle, but they also had these passageways that had been built that allowed for the movement of the people. And the idea is the, the you know the different aspects of the ceremonies that are taking place. Those passageways serve like roads, is basically what's taking place. I'm going to toss this in here now. Some of you maybe have been to uh, to Tillicothe and to the Mounds Park that's down there. And they have a whole variety of these smaller mounds. There's a place in Tillicothe called uh, High Banks, and it sits on the side of the river. It's not open to the public yet. It's more of a research area that's taking place. It also has an octagon, and it also has a circle. It's just that they're, they're I forget which one's which now. The octagon is the same size, the circle is a lot smaller. But what makes this fascinating is if you take the moon sighting, 
This is basically what we call observatory circle. If you take the moon's sighting that goes here, and you follow that straight on down to the river and on down towards Chillicothe, if you can see the white line running down here, this is Newark, this is Chillicothe. It lines up when it leaves the octagon and circle here, right straight through the middle of it. It enters the octagon and the circle in Chillicothe, somewhere around 60 miles apart. They have identified enough remnants of what looks like an old road, we call it passageway, but a road uh, between Newark and Chillicothe, that what they believe is that there was a road that was pretty much straight with those walls on either side as a passageway. From basically the winter solstice to the summer solstice, which is uh, middle, you know, end of December till end of June, they would take moon measurements in Chillicothe. And then from summer solstice to the winter solstice, late summer and fall, they would take those measurements for Newark. This was ceremonial, so there would have been a grand procession, most probably, that would walk this 60 miles along this road that's been here. They go, straight road, it's, you can sort of see the yellow, that's the highway, I've been up and down that highway a number of times, and it's not straight. If you're familiar, some of you might be familiar with the Romans, and when the Romans built roads, they made them straight, because they wanted to be able to move armies pretty quick, so they were straight and flat. Apparently that's what happened with this. A few years ago, the college did a walk along the ancient uh, Great Hopewell Road. Now this obviously is not a road, it's somebody's lane, it's along the way. But they walked from Chillicothe in a procession up to Newark, took about a week to, to make that procession under Native Americans and the drums and all kinds of different things that were taking place. And they walked out as, as close as they could to sort of get a feel as to what that would have been like. And apparently, that's what the Native Americans would have done in the process of making these measurements that are, that are taking place here. Now this is Observatory Hill, which is observatory, it's a name that we give it. This is speculation, obviously it's done 2,000 years ago, they didn't leave a written record. The oral history was lost because the Native Americans were decimated when the Europeans arrived. Um, you know, disease and all that the Europeans brought just wiped out up to 90% of the Native Americans, which meant the ability to pass knowledge from one generation to the next was lost. That's probably the reason that Chief Wallace had no clue of any of this, because her people were removed from Ohio, and all that knowledge being passed. And if you, you know, as I look around, I know a couple of us have no children, so we're not passing anything on. Okay, so if you don't get that knowledge passed on, it doesn't take too many generations. You're missing a lot. And that's what's taking place here. And I, I show you this just to give you an idea of, of again, what the wall looks like and the, the, the way they would have been trying to deal with it. You know, this is a nice aerial shot. The Americans couldn't go up in a balloon, they didn't have airplanes. You know, most of these are, are nice aerial shots so you can see what it looks like. They would have been on ground level. They're building mounds that are over their head. How do they do that? A lot of speculation, we don't have too many I haven't heard too many ideas that are convincing. You know, a lot of ideas thrown out there, but I don't, I'm not sure what they are, but something like Observatory Hill would have been pretty critical so that they could be up on that hill and what the, you know, the chief shaman would have been there to, to lead. Yes, sir. What, what was the landscape like roughly at that era, as far as being open or being wooded or? Good, good question. This was considered prairie, is what they found, based upon uh, some of the core samples that they've done. They've identified and, and decided it's been prayer because now it's pretty wooded. Newark is right at the edge of the glaciated, non-glaciated area of Ohio. So as soon as you move uh, west and north of you know, 
more fast. Uh, Newark, you're into the glacier, everything gets turned pretty flat. As soon as you go to the, you know, to the south and to the east of Newark, you're into the hills because it didn't get glaciated. So that's basically what's taking place. So, so if the trees aren't there and it's pretty much prairie, at least they would have that view. It's harder to tell that because you've got the trees all over the place. So, good point. So I, what I'm trying to get at is as we look at this, we keep in mind that these are people that you know, we consider backwards in our cultures we settled as part of the country. They didn't know very much. Uh, we couldn't identify that they had any kind of a uh, alphabet or writing skill. You know, it's because the way they wrote messages wasn't on paper like we did. So it was, you know, a different way. But it's obvious that they were, had some real talent to do something because they were able to accomplish something that wasn't uh, wasn't matched over in Europe for you know, a long time. So. When we talk about what's taking place with this, this concept of place, when Chief Wallace was able to see what's, what's happened here, to be able to identify and realize that it was her ancestry, or the ones that built this. Now you say, well, was it, you know, Shawnee? It was Native American. And all the Native Americans probably, at least on this side of the country, probably came from somewhat of a you know, basic, pool of, of Native Americans. I don't know about the Navajo and the Hopi and some of the Western groups that may have been a whole different genealogical branch. You have to ask the genealogist here to <laughs> track that down for you. But she recognized that even though her people lost how they did it, it was basically her people before that that made this happen. And so that's why I say when I drive down Hosford Road and I see my grandparents' house, there's memories of like that. Until somebody would have pointed out where my grandmother's house was, that house wouldn't have meant anything. And that's what's taking place. To me, that's what's taking place here. This whole concept, this whole development that's, that's happening here. Um, one thing I did mean to mention, and I, and I failed to do that, the earliest established settlement in Ohio that we know of was about 13,000 uh, BC. 13,000, it would be about 15,000 years ago. And that was up in Medina County. So it's the closest thing that I know of that it's around here. And you know, there was different kinds of, of relationships that are taking place with those people. But that's a pretty, pretty big gulf between that and when this is taking place. So we've gone through these different, different uh, aspects, different um, uh, cultures are taking place. And I'll probably come back to this here in, in well, actually, I need to do that right before I do anything here. Um, we need to move on to the Mississippi here in a minute. But one other thing I, I said, remember the uh, gap that they had in, in here. And I want to point this out. One of the con theories, and I'm going to put it with theory because we don't know, obviously. One of the ideas of theories is why the gap in you know, the circle here, why the gap at certain spots. The idea in this time period was that uh, Native Americans would have, these people anyway, the Hopewell would have believed that when a person dies, their soul needs to be released from their body and needs to be able to return to the heavens to, from whence it came. And what they have decided, they've discovered, is that this gap is the northeast corner, or the northeast part of the circle, and it focuses on the Milky Way. And the idea is that the Native Americans would consider this a religious ceremony where their, their dead, not that they necessarily brought their dead here, but it would represent their dead being released to leave the human body, therefore the enclosure is taking out, and would join the stream of other souls. If you think of Milky Way, it's a whole batch of different stars, you know, that they're, they're, it looks like a whole stream, would join those other ones in the process of moving or flowing off to, to the heavens or wherever they go. So it's not like 
they're just a circle and, and set up. They actually are focused. Everything that they have that's been built has some type of a relationship on the heavens or the earth that give them purpose. It's not like they just built it for the sake of building it. Chillicothe was the other half of, if you want to call it that, the other half of the Newark complex. Uh, it has more mounds than the Newark complex. The Newark complex is larger. It's tied with the passageway that ties them together. The passageway, I mean, the, the, uh, the alignment of the octagon and the circle at 60 miles apart come virtually exactly in, together. It's not like you know, one's got the entrance over here and the other's the entrance over here. They're made so that they can actually be tied together. So, pretty significant that things are taking place here. Why did they disappear? We don't know. Around 500 AD, the culture collapsed. There might have been some kind of climate aspect. They speculated about that. Crops failed. They speculated about that. Uh, one of the thing, a couple of the things that they're reasonably certain of. These are ceremonial versus the Adena culture, which was more of a burial than uh, circular type of mounds, um, conical type of mounds. These are much more geometric. They were not built by slave labor, from what they can tell. So somehow they've got the people to come together, work together to make this. It doesn't appear to be warfare, because they don't have the, the evidence that would be, that would reflect that. And the peoples that would have existed at this time would have been much more, uh, we'll say clans, because it's probably the thing that we can you know, identify with. So it had to be a bunch of the smaller clans that would come together, because there's no way, it's, it's not an urban area. It, there wasn't a permanent settlement here. This was ceremonial. They came to, to do the ceremony, and then they left. This isn't where they lived. So how do these people get enough people together to move that much dirt? How do they feed all these people? And to me, I keep thinking, um, I go out there and look for the moon. I'm not sure I'm going to find it tonight, because it's probably behind the clouds. It's going to be 18 years before it comes back to be in that exact same place again. How many snowy nights? How many foggy nights? How many dark, you know, rainy nights? Are you not going to be able to make those measurements? I, I, it baffles me as to how that takes place. I, I have no clue. You said when, when they moved from Chillicothe to Newark, seasonally. That's what, one of the places I've read. Spec, and this is speculation. speculation. Yeah, yeah. everything's speculation because there's no. There's no record to tell us. You've got to figure out think they were constantly taking measurements all been, the time at one location or the other. We, you have to assume, you know, 700 years of, yeah, they would be doing that all the time. But even, I'd like to know what the childbirth practices were. <laughs> There's no way that we can get past a couple of generations where our grandkids are going to be that patient and do all that kind of stuff that we thought that you got to do this. You know, basically on a regular basis, and you're going to have to do it a long time. You know, we don't we don't operate that way. So I I have I, I don't understand how that takes, but we don't. As far as I know, nobody does. There's a lot of speculation. But the measurements have to be taken because if you're going to make this kind of, I mean, the walls line up perfectly. It's not like they just happenstanced almost. They are lunar based. It's not just a, there's a couple that connect with solar, but most of those connect because of the, where the moon is, and that's what they've used as their their measuring thing. Because if they can measure where the moon is, they can speculate when there's going to be eclipses. They can you know track uh, agricultural seasons. All kinds of those types of things are important to them, which is you know, over our head to, to understand. So. That's, that's the exciting part. And that's why the big push to make this one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. I mean, this is unique. There is nowhere else in the world that, that has this kind of thing. And it's, it's a reflective of a society that, you know, whether we want to consider it advanced or not, they're doing some mighty interesting uh, complex measurements and, and to make this all happen. But the society did pass out, pass away. Roughly about 500 AD, it ceased to exist. 
And at that point, I'm sure not leave anybody out here. We move into the fourth period of mound building, which is what we refer to as the Mississippian period. Mississippian is probably going to say, well, I've probably got something to do with Mississippi River. And you're right, it's built much more along that. It moves. It's not centered as much in Ohio. That's it. It's a little farther west. This is Fort Ancient. It's over in the uh, Dayton area. And again, it's another one of these places, part of the, the mounds that you want to see. This uh, has this wall that goes around. It's the largest single enclosure area um, in the world, I believe. And the idea was it's named Fort Ancient because they thought it was a fort. And then they thought about it, well, there's something like 86 gaps in the wall. Uh, that'd be a little hard to defend. And it covers, you know, a incredible amount of acreage. You couldn't get enough people inside to, to do it as a fort. So they've decided since the name's come out that it's probably against ceremonial. It's not, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with defense. This is a road that's coming in, you know, punctures through the wall. The Mississippian era, uh, era is, uh, most of you are familiar with Cahokia, which is you know, the, the famous mound out in uh, southern Illinois, just outside St. Louis. And that is part of what they call the Mississippian. Our area of the Mississippian is what we call Fort Ancient, sort of like a branch of the Mississippian culture. And this would be in the neighborhood of, we'll say somewhere around 500 AD, until roughly the time the Europeans came. And it's probably, their collapse may be connected to the Europeans, not for certain. Probably, you know, this is one thing that you've seen uh, before I go to my next little big slide. I'll digress for just a moment. One of the great things that's come along here of late, and late I mean just in the last 10 years basically, is what we call LIDAR which is sort of a uh, geophysical radar kind of a thing, where they can penetrate the ground and see what's underneath there without having to disturb the ground because these are sacred sites and it's Native Americans don't want people to start their bulldozers digging it up to see what's down there. So they've been able to penetrate the ground to see what's there. And what it shows is when the dirt has been compacted, such as walls or holes dug where there used to be posts or wood that are obviously not there anymore. Those kinds of things are, show up in this. That's why it's kind of nice to have the, the color contrast that's taking place. It helps show what was there before. It's a marvelous, fairly new way. If anybody's, you know, I should say anybody, if our one person who <laughs> took it up, it's going into a profession instead of coming out of it, would be interested in geophysical research and you know, that type of thing, that's, uh, to me, this would be most fascinating because there's so much is, is under, the, you know, it's buried that we can't see. And that what's revealed is probably going to change our historical concept of what's taking place. So that's something that's become very um, popular, it's, you know, not cheap. It's sort of like drones uh, in the air when they're flying around. It's the same kind of thing, revolutionizing our ability to do research. So I throw that in there because it's something else that's adding to this. Chief Wallace didn't know about it. We didn't know about it. This is new. This is like, you know, all of us have been on the face of the earth in operational mode since this has come on board, basically. So we're not talking about something that's, we're talking about the, what they're looking at is thousands of years old. But the way to understand it is like, we're just doing it right now. We're in the process of learning that at this point. This is probably the most known mound in the state. It's the famous Serpent Mound. Anybody who's been down the Serpent Mound? Maybe? Okay. That's, again, all these are well worth going to visit. Serpent Mound, it looks like a serpent. It's in the process of uncoiling. And what they're saying, what their speculation is, is that it's got its mouth open and there's an egg in its mouth. And there's been a lot of debate about it. It's roughly about four or five feet high as a mound. Uh, it's actually constructed of a certain kind of dirt that's put up as a base, and this has all been built by Native Americans. This is debated as to how old it is. At one time, it was thought to be a Dina age, which is pretty old, because a couple little mounds around it are Dina mounds. And then they did a, a test 
uh, you know, a, 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 some samples out of the mound, and they decided, well, no, that's, that's uh, that couldn't be. It's, it's you know, it's got to be newer, much newer than that, because the, the charcoal the, the remains that they were hitting weren't that old. And then a few years ago, they did some more tests. Sounds like the way we do things. And they took some core samples out of out of it. And what they discovered is, well, you know, this could actually be back uh, almost you know, 1,500 years old. After all, maybe it's not quite as current. So the bottom line is, it's debatable as to how old it is. But until just recently, what we would say is this is much newer than those mounds. These mounds are 2,000 years old. This was maybe you know, seven, eight hundred years old or so, a lot newer. We blend all the mounds together. They didn't exist together. There's thousands of years apart between these cultures. So a lot has changed, even when it's a slope change. But again, is there a relevance or a significance to this? What they have also decided is that this mound faces towards Polaris, which is one of the constellations. And that's this actually has some astronomical significance in the way it's laid out and what it's looking at. What do we know? We can only speculate off of what we find, what it lines up with, and then guess you know, at, at that point. So bottom line is, move this one out of the way, and that brings me to my last of my slides. The thing I did not say, and I need to comment on. This is what we call an effigy mound. It's a mound that's made to look like some animal of some sort, you know, some life form. There are basically two of those in the state of Ohio. Serpent Mound, which everybody in the world knows, one of the you know, great icons and, and mounds to be preserved. And one that we call Alligator Mound, which is over in Granville down by Newark, which almost nobody knows, including most of the people live in Granville. It's, you can just barely see it on here. It sits on top of a hill, and they've decided it was probably misnamed when it was being described. The Europeans were trying to understand what the native peoples were saying. The Europeans read it as being an alligator, so we call it alligator mound. It's probably more like a panther, because a panther is much more uh, essential and, and central to their uh, uh, religious belief systems. There aren't any alligators in Ohio, so I'm not quite sure where this would come from. It's just the idea came up from you know, from trade or something. But this exists, the road goes around it. You can visit this, it's it's open to the public. You can figure out how to get to it. There's just no parking at the top of the hill. You basically park in the middle of the street where you go look at it. So. But it does show that you know effigy mounds are in the vicinity of the Hopo mounds, but it's hundreds and hundreds of years and centuries apart in terms of being built. As you go farther west, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Missouri, I believe, Iowa, you'd find a lot more effigy mounds. For whatever reason, the culture seemed to size it up there, and it wasn't back in this part of the world. So, so that brings me pretty much to the end of my comments until I look back and say a couple of things I forgot I couldn't tell you about. Uh, Okay, so that brings me back to my original question, and we talk about the, the Indigenous Peoples Day and whether that should be a day that's included as a holiday. And I thought, felt, you know, thought about this for a long time, but when I look at what has taken place and the historical nature and the significance of what is here, to me, that needs a day that gets celebrated. It's Native American, but we all celebrate this. Uh, one of the articles in the book that I pointed out, if I can find my quote in here real quick. Should have highlighted it so I can do that. Um, of course, I want to see it. Now that I want to read it. There it is. There's a, one of the authors is Mary uh, McDonald, and her piece talks about uh, the value of these, uh, the, the you know 
in terms of society and our culture today. And just to read a sentence that she puts uh, in, her, in her statement, she says, in sum, the new work earthworks are simultaneously part of the heritage of the indigenous peoples of North America, part of the heritage of all who live in the United States today, part of the heritage of the indigenous peoples of the world, and part of world heritage. This represents such an incredible accomplishment. My ancestry has absolutely zero to do with it as far as I know. I think I can say, I mean, listen to your discussion earlier, you don't think you have any Native American in you. So the, the chances are most of us in this room have zero connection with this. But the people that were here before us in the land that we live in has this. And I think that is a marvelously important piece of our culture today, that I think it would be so valuably represented to have a special day. Now, I'm going to voice my opinion. You can disagree with me 100% on this if you want to, and that's fine. What I wish is the day was picked that was connecting something this significant to the day of the, of the year that's taking place. Equinox some moonrise, some, something that happens, instead of being put as a replacement day for something that took place. Because I personally feel Columbus, regardless of how we look at what's taken place since Columbus arrived, you know, the change of land ownership and control and, and disease and, and bad relations, the Eastern and Western worlds have been welded together. And they're not gonna come apart. And that day represents when that world, everybody in the eastern part of the world and everybody in the western part of the world realize there's another half to this world. And I think that needs to be recognized too. Like, to me, that's what happens with Columbus Day. But this needs to be also be recognized. This is an incredible wealth of richness that I think we should be able to all take great pride in. Native Americans, they should be just as proud as, you know, popping all the buttons that they got because they've been told for you know, centuries that they didn't have the ability to do anything like this. And it's obvious that they did because it's here. We didn't do it, somebody did it. So we've got to assume it's uh, you know, them that did it. So to, to recognize that and honor that, I think is, is a marvelous thing. To connect it like I wish we could do to something that was lunar, I think would be, would just enhance it that much more. It hasn't happened, I don't think it will. I just, I wish that's what would happen. So that is my true sense of that. So, so bottom line, place. I think you understand why I think that is. Location's fine. If this was over in Africa, up in British Columbia, out in Wyoming, it would be nice, but we wouldn't, you know, we might go visit a vacation, but we probably wouldn't worry about it. But it's here, right here in Ohio, right down the road from me, you know, almost across the street. From you, an hour's drive and you, you, you can be there. It is so close, so part of us. And it represents such a wealth of, of historical cultural development and advancement, the, the complexity that's gone into the measurements that have taken place in the construction is just mind boggling. It's, it's incredible what's taken place. So I think the concept of place is just absolutely the overwhelming piece to this to me. And I think uh, the quote I gave from Chief Wallace is when she stepped out of the car and she saw it, it's just sort of like, bam, that's my people. That's my, my heritage that did that. And I think that is an incredible concept. So, questions? Or, and I didn't ask, I've asked you if you've been there. Have either of you been to? I've not, no. Okay. Yeah, if you get a chance, um, there's an open house Sunday. Yes, there is. There. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, there's uh, to go on the octagon. There's four open houses a year, and that's it. Four days that you go. This is in court. It's made it to the Supreme, the Ohio Supreme Court. They're going to make the decision of what happens with the golf course. Um, uh, it's it's the golf people know that they're going to have to move. It's whether they can. Were the golf people really that into golf? Pardon? 
where the hope well really that into go? <laughs> That's a pretty sore spot at this point, as you can. Yeah, it's interesting because we look at this, and I mean, it's pretty obvious when you look at the houses around here. If the golf course didn't have it, that wouldn't be here. It'd be like the right square one. There's a couple little elements left, and that's all you can identify. The rest of it's all refurbished for you know, retooled for urban development, and that's what would have happened to this. This one's been a park for a long time, so it's been protected because it is a park. But this one um, is protected only because of the golf course. Now. But of course, the golf is insulting to Native Americans because this is sacred land, and you know you're climbing up and down the hills, swatting balls, and kicking all the Native Americans off so that you can play golf, and, and it's understandable. So the time has come, and I, I think the golf people know that time has come to move on. But you can't just, they've got a huge investment here. You can't just walk out the door and not have some way to you know, relocate. You can't start from scratch somewhere else with no, no financial buyout on this. So if you get mad at anybody, get mad at the Ohio uh, History Connection people, the old historical society. They're the ones that leased it out for almost nothing and signed the contract for another 50 years here, uh, about 10 years ago or something like that. So. Just, just for your information, I grew up with the I've uh, been with the Eskimos and Indians in Alaska, and they have a great oral history that they pass on, right, right, because they've never had it written, right, and they still are very want, wanting to pass out their oral history. So I think some of this has been related and related and related. It, it has. And Be, because I don't think you could do that every year, or uh, some of this probably has been oral history, and they've taken the oral history and uh, done what they were supposed to do. Well, if it's like anything, it's ceremonial. You bring the children and you, you walk them through why they're doing this and what this means. And this gets in Britain. I mean, if you do. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Jews, you know, when they grow up, if, even if they leave their faith, there are certain pieces that, you know, and they do the bar about mitzvah and those kind of things that have become so grained in them that they, no matter what else they've done, they still relate to that. So that's, that's what's happening. Uh, and you know, we, we rely on written word, and that's great, but that's a luxury. Uh, if you've got to have food eat and protection, I'm not going to sit down and write a book. <laughs> so. Like I said, their oral history and their culture is very dear and they're dear more, to them. Right, they're more in the margin out there, so they've been able to preserve that. The library will close in 30 minutes. <laughs> the left automatically shut down for 15 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I have at least five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what you're saying is that what they're doing is the Native Americans are rediscovering their sense of place. Exactly. Right, exactly. They have, the Shawnee lived here for, you know, a couple hundred years, came in in, uh, what, the early 1700s or something like that. They were here for quite a while. And they didn't, they knew the mounds were here. They probably didn't have a relationship necessarily to what happened because by then, the decimation because of disease and war and everything else had replaced that opportunity to, to pass, you know, the children across these areas and explain what's going on. They've lost that. So, weren't the Shawnee driven out by the Iroquois in the 1600s? No, no. Okay. They should just the reverse almost. Yeah. The Iroquois controlled Ohio as as hunting ground and destroyed the Erie, which were mm. I mean, for where they were located. And then, as the Iroquois started to lose some of their power or control, then the, we'll say the emptiness, which is a bad way to phrase it, but the, the area here was, um, the, the Shawnee moved up from farther south. They were more down Tennessee and Kentucky, as I understand it. They moved up to, to fill here, as, as did the Delaware and why not, and others. And then, and, what is it, 1840s, I think 1845 is when the last Native American, well, last the Wyandots were taken out, but Shawnee left a little bit before that, were removed from Ohio. So, so they were here, 
would have been their ancestors, but they weren't here as you know, participants necessarily. But it's like, you know, we identify with our ancestry that did great things. I don't identify with anybody that built the Great Wall of China because I don't, not connected there, but some of the things, you know, England or whatever, my people would have been involved in somewhere or whatever. So somebody researching mounds in Ohio, like you say there's like multiple organizations that aren't really, yeah, how, how does somebody go about learning and plugging into this that aren't research-based? <laughs> Good question. Where do you point somebody to start? Uh, one of the first things I would do is a couple of books, and there's a ton of them, but this is fairly recent and therefore more up to date in terms of what's going on. And the nice part about it, it's a series of papers. So they take different views and they don't necessarily agree with each other, you know, and I like that. It's, they're not all come from the same camp. And then the references that they use. Uh, there's um, the, the ancient. I always forget what they call this. Do you think after all this time? I'm going to say the ancient. Uh, I'll have to track it down. The ancient Ohio. I think it's called the Ancient Ohio Trail. Org. Is kind of a gathering place. It's a nice website. It gives a lot of little uh, pieces of information, a little excerpts and recordings and stuff. And from what I can tell, it's still active trouble with so many historical things that get a big burst of activity and then they lose interest and go away, which is, but that one, when I looked it up here the last you know, week or two ago, it had developed a lot since the last time I looked at it. So I mean, somebody's still working on it. So that, that was good. And as I said, we've got the Newark Earthworks Center, the Native American organization over in Columbus, um, the archives that I, my archives is collecting information on the mound builders of what are called the Eastern Woodlands, which is uh, kind of broad, anybody build mounds in the Eastern part of the United States. And therefore I've got a lot of material in Illinois and, and you know, other places. Those mounds are related, but not, and they're still Hopewell mounds, but not necessarily Ohio Hopewell. I mean, people would have still lived 100 miles apart, I doubt they, they didn't jump on, you know, they didn't have horses, so they didn't jump on, whatever that had jumped on to ride over here. And it's a long walk. So that's what that's one of the things that bugs me to, to know. And it's how in the world do you get enough people that you don't, I mean, if I'm standing out here in the middle, you've been in it. If I'm standing out here in the middle, I'm gonna say, okay, our project for this week is we're gonna start moving dirt. Well, maybe do, but I mean, I've got a moat around the whole inside of the circle that's uh, about 15 feet deep, and I got a mound that's you know like 20 feet high, and I'm going to move dirt from someplace to someplace to make this happen. And I'm going to do it. Who's going to do it? Who's going to feed the kids? You know, uh, who's going to? Who's who's who's? I, that is totally beyond me. I don't know. There wasn't. I mean, there's a lot of people. I said there might have been as many as uh, 55, you know, 57 million Native Americans in North America before the. Europeans here. There might be, but you know, we got 320, 300, what, almost 340 million people in the United States. I can't picture us rounding up a whole lot of folks going out there with baskets and, and sticks and saying, start all the day. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't know how they do that. I, I think it's most badly. But if you're looking for an area to study, I mean, this is still opening up the whole. Hopewell Trail, I'm hoping LIDAR gets used because they've found remnants all along the, the way. So if they can actually track where that is, that would be so fun. That'd be, I think that'd be pretty cool. So. Anything else? Come, come to nowhere. Come take advantage of the day you get to a tour of this so they can actually show you because you need somebody to tell you what you're looking at. Otherwise, when you're standing there, it's their, their mounds, you know, you're not going to see much unless you're in the golf course. And when you get up on top of the, you know, the tee off, a lot of those are connected with when they were building the mounds and stuff. So it's, it's you know, originally uh, very reflexive. And then the great circles always, always a good one. So, I appreciate you coming. And I hope you got something out of it. I hope you got enough to at least get some credit. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So.
take a card if you want one. And uh, if you got any questions, you sure drop me a note. So. Yeah, I will yeah, answer what I can. Well, thank you. This was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.